That way I can get this out of here. All right, what's that? The chat room's not letting me log in. Are you seeing the stuff I'm putting in? Uh, hold on. Uh oh. Okay. Alright. Ready to go? Yep. Okay, let's see here. Let's get this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hutch Jr. This is episode 71. I'm coming to you from Brookline, a neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh, deep, deep down in the SCR bunker. And I'm Ward Miller, also from Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm here uh, in Mission Control. Uh, Hutch, this is another one of them times where we're going to go. We ain't going to make it, and Lord knows if we don't. I'm telling you, it's uh, we got a lot of lot of information to share, and we're starting off a little bit late. Incidentally, this is a Saturday evening show, uh, the first time we've done that, uh, just due to life getting in the way. You know, it's what happens. Now we got a a couple enhancements. I was able uh, yesterday. Uh, our syndicator, Libsyn, uh, Wizard Media, developed an app that you can now catch the show directly from the Facebook page. So That's outstanding. If, if you look under the banner, there's uh, our little icons there, our little avatar or whatever, and uh, SCR is underneath it. You hit that, and I have it configured uh, that it'll list the whole, I think it's all of them. It's at least the last 10 shows. So you can play them right there. You don't even have to... Uh, have to go anywhere. That's kind of cool. I like when they up their game like that. They've been steady like that. That's outstanding. Uh, also, uh, from Eric, uh, he suggested uh, a change in the format of the show notes links page. So I, I managed to do that, too. So hopefully you guys will like that. And it makes a little bit more sense. I mean, if you hear a, a story that we're doing that, uh, you know, interests you or whatever, you can always go there because we're never going to be we're not going to sit here and just be news readers i mean we read some but uh there's just not enough time in an hour our stories aren't fluff pieces you know they have a little background to them yeah so you really got to go and and do your research that's one of the things that we we harp about do your research don't just listen to what we say look i mean we that's why we give you the, the uh all the information on the links so that you can go back and you can look and you can verify that what we're saying. Absolutely. Yep. We're not, uh, we're trying to do the job that the media is not. Uh, and incidentally, if you go to the website right now, uh, the top story on the website, uh, basically illustrates two of the, the elite media's top dogs. And this is like two or three days before the election in 08, admitting that they don't know anything about Obama. And I watched that. I heard it on the radio first, and then I went and tracked it down. And it's just stunning. It's it's completely. St- Why would you have these people at your at your company if they're sitting there and telling you that they don't know any? This has got to be the first time in history this ever happened. They're sitting there and they're just saying, "Well, we don't know what what Obama's worldview is, and we don't know what he thinks about on China." And I'm thinking, "My God, are you you're admitting that?" Yeah. You know, it's just. Uh, Amazing. I, I couldn't. Yeah, the one with Brokaw is the one that, that really got me. It's, it's, yeah. It, I mean, he basically just came out and blatantly admitted, yeah, we didn't check anything. It's nuts. They said we didn't do a good job. And, and it's and it, he did the same thing with terrorism. That's you know, criminal. They, you know, he says, yeah, you know, we talked about it, and, man, yeah, it just wasn't that important. That was in 1999. Yeah. So. Well, last week, Ward, we, we struck a nerve. I, I think – it, we're, we're getting close to the point where we're going to have to ban Ron Paul from the show. You know, because <laughs> we talk about this guy every single week, man. It never fails. It's, uh, Eric uh, got a little upset at, at some of my uh, 
monologue there, and he sent us about 14 emails, uh, but I'm going to concentrate on one. Uh, he says, I'm sending this because I want you guys in the SCR audience to know that the Paul campaign is trying to play by GOP rules. When supporters go rogue and attempt hostile takeovers, they are disavowed. He sends a link, a link. And by the way, in case you didn't notice, I long ago gave up on trying to convince you guys that Ron Paul is worth supporting over Romney or that his foreign policy stance isn't loony. I know that's whistling in the wind. All I want is for you to think more critically about the news you read about Paul and give the guy fair treatment. You don't have to like him. You should, however, stick to facts and not resort to smears to refute him. The same goes for Obama, Romney, or anyone else in the news. If you disagree with something they say or do, such as the Paul delegate strategy, say so and refute it with facts and reason. Don't make accusations you can't back up. I didn't make any accusations I can't back up. Uh, I, I, I don't think I did either. I'll admit that I don't like him, but I thought about him. And I also, uh, I went back and listened to what I said, and I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I, I don't think that they're not playing by the rules. I just don't think, and, and the same way that that uh, Romney was pushed on me, I didn't appreciate that either. Romney is the least uh, likely candidate that I would have voted for right in front of Ron Paul. Uh and I don't like the way the RNC or the what the establishment or whatever you want to call it uh, pushed him on me either. But uh, Ron Paul, the, the the idea that the popular vote and, and I should wait until the, I am I'm going to wait because uh, he sent a voicemail too, and I was about ready to start responding to that, but I'll wait and play it first. Uh, he also sent me a uh, one of the things that they send to the Ron Paul people, their folks. And it basically uh, says that Ron Paul is not dropping out or suspending his campaign. He's going all the way to the convention. He's deeply grateful for every re resource. And he said, to this end, our campaign has several positive and realistic goals. Having recently won Maine, we believe we can win several more states. We will win party leadership positions at both the state and national levels. We will continue to grow. Da, da, da. And then the thing that, uh, that got me about this, if I can find it, uh, it basically said that the uh, the delegates that they did get, a lot of the delegates that are uh, committed, here it is, is it? Anyway, basically what it says, I can't find it. It says that the, a lot of the delegates that are committed to Romney are Ron Paul supporters. And I just think that that whole, the whole thing, I, I, I don't know. Maybe they're playing by the rules. I don't like the rules. Yeah, uh, the the thing that gets me about the whole you know uh, Ron Paul position is basically he said he's he's not going to campaign in any states that haven't voted yet. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. This is what he said: I'm not voting in any states that haven't. I'm not I'm not campaigning in any states that have, haven't voted yet. I'm going to save my money and hopefully, you know, they'll come around. The thing is, the th the thing that I was trying to say. Uh, is that a majority of people in the Republican Party do not want Ron Paul to be the nominee. And should that, that idea should be front and center in the contest. And if it's yeah. not, then it's skewed. Well, If, if there's people know, saying that they're Romney supporters and then they go and vote for Paul, uh, that's skewed. That's not the way that it's supposed to work. And I can promise you this. Ron Paul supporters, the Republican Party, and by that I don't mean the establishment people in charge in Tampa. I'm talking about me. Are not going to let Ron Paul hijack the Republican nomination because that place will burn down first. You know what I mean? There'll be disruption at the Tampa convention before that's allowed to be pushed on to the Republican Party. I think the Republican Party, and that was figurative on the burn down part. But the Republican Party, in my opinion, should ban Ron Paul. Rand Paul is, I mean, Ron Paul is not a Republican by any stretch of the imagination. They should ban him outright and disqualify him from anything. That's the way I feel about it. I mean, he basically comes out and calls himself a libertarian. How can he be a libertarian and run on the Republican ticket? Because he libertarians be are such a small percentage of the electorate. That he never win. That's correct. 
and and that's what he should run as. They should not allow him to charade as a Republican anymore. He's causing too. This is too important of an election to be playing games with this guy. It just is. First of all, he can't win. If by some stretch that the, the Republican Party is that inept that Ron Paul would become the nominee, he would get crushed by Obama. I mean, the people that are voting for Obama are half brain dead to start with, a lot of them. All you got to do is trumpet out Ron Paul in front of them, and it's over. You know, a politics is a game like war that we're going to talk about in a second after this phone call. Uh, politics is a, a game that you play to win. It's not something that you, you fool around with. And uh, anyway, <laughs> that's that. But uh, Eric was so kind to call the show. So uh, what we'll do is we will try to find it here and kick on the audio and, and take a listen to what uh, Eric had to say. Hey, guys, it's your buddy Eric. Um, about 20 minutes into episode 70, I had some quick thoughts. Um, so there are any other things that irritate me that I want to respond to, but we'll just stick with these for now. Uh, one uh, amusing note, um, at about 11 minutes, maybe 11 and a half minutes in, I think there was some Hutch Bonics. I think uh, you invented a new word. It was uh, immaculated or something. Uh, I don't know what the hell you were trying to say, man, but it didn't sound like English. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the email that I sent you about that planning thing, it wasn't it wasn't the treatment of Islam or Muslims that was irritating me. The problem I had with it is it was using as its model despicable actions. The firebombing of Dresden, the dropping of the bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and what have you, Taking war to civilians is despicable. It is a horrible violation of just war, and it's just an incredibly inhumane and awful thing to do. That's my problem. It's not planning for uh, worst-case scenarios. It's taking war to civilians. Um, and as far as the delegates go, um, you were complaining about the fact that Romney won you know, some large percentage, and he didn't get that same percentage of delegates. Well, guess what? Those... Uh, primary counts, they're beauty contests. They mean nothing. They're meaningless. They're just for show. Each state, each county, each precinct, what have you, like they've got their own rules about how uh, delegates are selected to the convention, and it has jack shit to do with the popular vote. The popular vote isn't what gets somebody to be the nominee for the Republican Party, or even the Democratic Party, uh, for that matter. So look it up. All the front poll people are doing is, is following the rules of the GOP. They're playing by the rules. There's nothing shady. There's nothing shady about playing by the rules. If anything shady, it's all the different ways that the party uh, apparatus has gotten behind Romney and tried to shut out the Ron Paul people who are just following the rules. So um, I'm going to go back to listening to the show, and hopefully I don't have to call again. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's start at the beginning. Immaculate is a Rush Limbaugh euphemism that he uses uh, to describe the religious manner in which the media blessed Obama when he was elected. That's kind of the inauguration, and that's where that came from. I didn't make that word up. Well, it may not actually be a word, uh, an English right. word, but it may be a Rush word. But it wasn't a Hutch Bonics. I had I heard it somewhere <laughs> else. Uh, <laughs> the second thing is, and probably the most important thing, uh, and this is this is another reason why uh, libertarians just uh, don't get it, man. I mean, really, the United States of America, if you look at it, hasn't won a war since World War II. We haven't really lost on the battlefield, but we haven't won a war since World War II. The only way that you win a total war is by bombing the civilians. That might be hard for you to take. That might be ugly. That might be animalistic, which it is. But you have to get a country to lose its will to wage war. And to do that, you have to do it through the politicians and the people that are running the nation, not just killing military people. And, I mean, it's not, it's not pretty, you know, and, but we didn't invent it either. And I have no problem with that. I don't. Well, when you consider what happened with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which he pointed out, um, they were given a warning, you know, and 
you know, Truman basically told him, we have this devastating weapon that we are going to unleash on you if you don't surrender. And actually, they, it sped And they it. called his bluff. It sped it, and it made it more humane, if you can even bring humane into the, into the conversation. But I don't need to look it up, Eric. If you, if you look at uh, McNamara, who was a Secretary of Defense during, World, during the Vietnam War, he worked for the Air Force in targeting during World War II. And we killed hundreds of thousands of more people uh, than just in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the weeks leading up to that, we were using conventional incendiary uh, munitions in their larger cities. I forget how many cities that we got, but it almost drove McNamara crazy having to kill that many people because the cities were made primarily of wood. So when an incendiary device was detonated, it burned the whole goddamn city down and everybody in it. You know, Dresden was almost as bad. Dresden people dry roasted, you know, in bomb shelters. But again, when, when you're talking about war and you're talking about survival, you're talking about our parents' lives were saved, you know, because they were, they were, they were forecasting at least a million American servicemen dying if we had to go into Japan proper with infantry. Yeah, I mean, the, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought a swift end to World War II. It did. It, 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 it advanced. I mean, and like I said, Truman gave them a warning. The same, way when, like the, just, the same way when the Russians came into Berlin. Whoop, there it is. It's yeah. over. You know, I mean, it's just ugly. It's not, and libertarians refuse to accept the fact that we're animals and that we just happen to be the tamest animals and the other ones that are in the world, we can just pretend they're not there. Well, yeah, and, and, and they take this stance where it's a holier than now, and you can't, you know, you got to, when you're fighting your enemy, you got to be willing to do whatever your enemy is going to retaliate with. You're going to be and like us, be able to or you're going to be like France. Exactly. Germany came right into France, raped all their women, took over everything because they were like that. They yeah. wanted to appease them. And that's the problem we're seeing is because, you know, we're not, you know, because of the court of public opinion is the reason that they say, oh, you can't just, you know, indiscriminately bomb and you can't just do it wasn't this. Indiscriminate. All right. So let, let's talk about the Geneva Convention real quick. Yeah, you're right. We're, we didn't follow the Geneva Convention. Uh, first off, in World War II, the Geneva Convention didn't even know about nuclear weapons, so the use of the nuclear weapon in World War II is irrelevant. Number two, I think the using, Geneva Convention false, came out in '47 anyway. Yeah, and following the Geneva Convention, why is it that our enemies don't have to wear uniforms? Yeah. The Geneva Convention states that the opposing or that armies should wear uniforms so they can be identified from the civilians, but that's not happening either, Eric. You can't change the rules based on, you know, everybody should play by the rules because they don't. There's insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan, well, it's Afghanistan now, that are dressed as a regular little Joe Farmer that got a bomb strapped to his ass. He's not identified himself as a soldier, but yet he is launching an attack against our people. Some of them so are dressed as women. Yeah. So we have no option. You can't, you can't choose. When, you know, it's like, okay, well, we're going to follow the Geneva Convention. You can't always do that. And, and to, to pigeonhole yourself into a, we're going to only follow the Geneva Convention. Well, if that's the case, we shouldn't be shooting at anybody because all the people that are shooting at us aren't in uniform. Anyway, Eric, keep on listening. We enjoy your feedback. Don't necessarily, necessarily agree with you, but I wanted to clarify my point and uh, just be on record as saying that if we go and we have to fight Islam, if, if it – becomes a caliphate that I believe it's going to be. Uh, it's getting there closer and closer. This administration helped it out in Egypt and, and across the Middle East. Uh, then I would wholeheartedly support taking Mecca and Medina out without question. You know, but we give them fair warning, like you said, but uh, that's enough of that. Uh, it looks like uh, an outsider. We, we brought you the federal politician, the federal convict politician last week. And this week we have another outsider named Wolf that seems to be closing on Obama in Arkansas. He was within seven points the last time I looked, and he had the DNC all up in arms and, and uh, like, trying to disqualify him and everything else. So that's uh, – that's Yeah, and, and in fact, they said that they are going to be sending uh, Bill Clinton down there to uh, 
to try and, and, and try and you know bat, walk him back and I'll tell you what the, uh, the Obamas better watch Bill Clinton. I wouldn't trust Bill Clinton if I was the Obamas. <laughs> I've heard stories that he might be one of the ones that's pushing out these little uh, Jeremiah Wright things and whatnot. Uh, it's very possible. I, I wouldn't put it past him. Bill Clinton, there's no love lost between him and Obama. No. I, I guarantee and, and it. And the thing is, you know, even though Hillary said she wouldn't run again. Maybe Bill maybe, will. Maybe, maybe Bill will run again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he, all he had to do was sit out one term. Right. Uh, it looks like the, the Zimmerman hoax is coming apart at the seams. Uh, Trayvon's autopsy was uh, brought out. Another witness came out. And I, I just wonder how these people feel that came out so zealously uh, about this being a racial thing. You know, about I want to know why the media is not talking about this. I, I want to know why Reverend Al Sharpton isn't apologizing for the fact I agree. That, that he basically tried to start a, a race riot Absolutely. over something that he didn't have the all the information. And, and not just the politicians. What about the, the prosecutors? And the DAs that had this in discovery, that had oh, no. all these photographs and had all the, everything that we have now, they had. Exactly. And here's the deal. It wasn't the in the affidavit. The prosecutor isn't the one who wanted to push this. The prosecutor came in and basically said that that's why it took forever for them to, to sign the arrest warrant. They knew that it's a no win case. But the Justice Department and the Obama administration and Reverend Al Sharpton pushed them into, well, we got to arrest this guy. Even though all the evidence shows that he didn't do it, that he was defending himself, et cetera, et cetera, we, we got to ignore that and we got to bring in the, uh, you know, we got to take him into trial. We got to lock him up. We got to you know, make him do the perp walk, the whole nine yards. Now, now the Huffington Post is coming out with some guy, some obscure guy that said that uh, Zimmerman used to imitate the, the guy with the, the uh, ventriloquist with the terrorist thing. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's all. Now what the hell does that have to do with anything? Nothing. I mean, it's it's. That's the dumbest shit I ever heard. The the, the, the thing is, if they would have researched, you know, before they just start, they started to to figure out, okay, well, we're going to start a race war. They may want to look a little bit deeper in into Zimmerman's past before they came out and said, well, it's a white on black crime. Well, they were so happy. Really they were not a white guy. They were jumping up and down. They were just waiting for. They were waiting for something, some event. To fit in their mold, they were going to do this from three years ago. Oh yeah, this, this is just something that they miscalculated, and it wasn't the right thing. And they're, now they're not—they're not reporting on any real crimes that are going on in Baltimore and Philadelphia and everywhere else, uh, where where blacks are are beating up freaking white people. Now they—they're they, doing it for Trayvon. The, yeah, there's even a representative in Maryland that called him out and said, "Don't come to the Inner Harbor." Don't do it until the until the governor sends state police to control these black mobs. Don't come here; it's too dangerous. He was out and saw people getting beat up, and he just and they're calling him a racist and saying that he's just uh, doing a gimmick and this that and the other thing. It's not a gimmick, man. It's happening, and the media is failing, and so are police departments. Yeah, I mean the mainstream media is not reporting the autopsy facts where uh, Trayvon Martin had bruises on his knuckles yeah. that were, uh, you know, from beating Zimmerman's head in. And there's weed uh, in his body and his bloodstream. Yeah, that, that he had THC in his system that he was so he's he's high, his hands are all beat up. Everything is pointing to the fact that the that the story that Zimmerman told is true. Good thing he had a gun. Yeah. I mean He'd he be could be dead. It, it could have been the other way and then you would have never heard about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh anyway, ladies and gentlemen, your weekly jihad report. Thirty five it's up a little bit this week. Thirty five jihad attacks. Eight Allah Akbars, 190 dead bodies, and 560 critically injured. And that is brought to you from the religionofpeace.com. If you go there, you can see uh, the details behind those numbers. And uh, some of them are pretty gruesome, I'm, I'm here to tell you. But when I first saw this site, uh, I realized that we had to bring it to you because it's not coming from anywhere else. And you got to dig in to find it. And that's the reality of the religion of peace. Now, uh, in the United States of America, you can have a forged uh, birth certificate and get away with it and be elected president, Ward. Yeah. Uh, president Obama's lawyer admits the forgery, but dis disregards image as indication of Obama's in uh, ineligibility damage control. A recent ballot challenge hearing in New Jersey exposes a desperate strategy by Obama to distance himself from his forged certificate and 
induce the conceived value of transparent political popularity as the only legitimate qualification needed to hold the office of the presidency. After Mayacopa County Law Enforcement Agency conducted a six-month forensic investigation which determined the image of Obama's alleged 1961 birth certificate, or excuse me, certi certificate of live birth, posted to a government website in April of 2011 is a digital fabrication and did not originate from genuine paper document arguments from an Obama eligibility lawyer during a recent New Jersey ballot challenge hearing reveals the image was only was not only a fabrication but it was likely part of a contrived plot by counterfeiters to endow Obama with mere political support while simultaneously making the image intentionally appear absurd and therefore invalid evidence towards proving Obama's ineligibility in a court of law. So did you get that? Okay, so he cre they created a fake birth certificate and they did it so poorly so that they could get the controversy stirred up. How does that work? The whole thing is just, uh, why does he not have to give them give somebody a copy of the birth certificate in their hand. You know, I have to do I, I that all the time. I have to, I have to take my birth certificate tomorrow and take it well, somewhere and give it to somebody. Here's the thing. Okay. 20 years ago when I enlisted in the air force, when I went to the, to the MEP station, I had to present them my birth certificate, my social security card, my driver's license, any passport that I would have had, etc. I had to have that in order to be in the United States military. You have to have now, it to be, get a passport. Well, my question is, why doesn't the president of the United States, who is the commander in chief of the United States military, have not have to present the same type of identification that I did? It's unbelievable. And not only that, but we should know what he what he did in college. I mean, the whole college transcripts and his thesis. I mean, what did he write about at Harvard Law? You know, I don't know. I'll bet somebody influenced him, though. Reverend Jeremiah Wright offered a $150,000 bribe to stay quiet during 2008 election. No, no, no. God damn America. The New York Post dropped a bombshell Sunday morning from the soon-to-be-released unauthorized Obama biography titled The Amateur by Edward Klein that shed some light on the character of the president. According to the New York Magazine, controversial Rev Reverend Jeremiah Wright told Klein he was offered 150 large by a close friend of Obama in exchange for Wright's silence during the 2008 election. And it gets worse. Even Barack Obama made a personal plea for the Reverend to keep his mouth shut. Four made it like a movie script for our reading pleasure. Scene, P Senator Barack Obama and his Reverend Jeremiah Wright in the living room of the Parsonage of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Obama. I really wish you wouldn't do any more public speaking until after the November election. I wish you wouldn't speak. It's going to hurt the campaign if you do that. Right. I don't see it that way. And anyway, how am I supposed to support my family? Well, I wish you wouldn't speak in public. The press is going to eat you alive. I'm sorry you don't see it the way I do. Do you know what your problem is? Wright said, no. What's my problem? He says, you have to tell the truth. That's a good problem to have. That's a good problem for all preachers to have. That's why I could never be a politician, Obama. It's going to get worse if you go out there and speak. It's really going to get worse. Now, Mitt Romney, on the other hand, uh, is wrong on Reverend Wright. Uh, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is what scared me so much throughout the campaign. And I brought this to you numerous times. I told you that McCain, I, I mean, Mc, might as well be McCain that Romney is going to fight like McCain, and that means they're not going to fight. You know, you have an issue like Jeremiah Wright, you absolutely have to bring it to the front. Yesterday, Romney was asked by Town Hall's Guy Benson if the Reverend Jeremiah Wright is fair game in the 2012 election. Romney gave the wrong answer. He quickly rebuked a conservative pack for considering an ad about Obama and Wright. The TV ad campaign proposal had been leaked to the New York Times and was already being labeled racially charged. According to the Times, the Romney team has decided not to assail Obama's likability for fear personal attacks will backfire with independence. Message to the Republican establishment. 
do not muzzle those of us who want to focus on Obama's troubling history with angry Marxists, black and white, including Reverend Wright and Bill Ayers. This is not about race. It's about knowing who Obama is, understanding what he has already done to our country, and what he is capable of doing. President Obama chose as his personal advisor, spiritual mentor, Obama's words, and pastor, a thoroughly despicable man who hates America, whites, and Jews. Reverend Wright required church members to sign a pledge to disavow middle classness, and we're not supposed to talk about it because that man happens to be black. Why is skin color even an issue here? Do you remember how you felt the week following 9-11? How sad, how patriotic, how determined to protect America? Can you imagine going to church that Sunday and hearing a sermon that America deserved to be attacked and all the congregants cheering? That was Obama's church. Uh, it's just something. Democrats say that Obama's church is old news or that it isn't important to know about anymore. They say this because they can't say the ugly information about Obama's chosen church is untrue. It is entirely documented by the church's own website, church newsletters and pastor's pages, statements of belief, recordings and videos. There is actually no way to deny that Wright preached hate. Hundreds of thousands of people have viewed the video of Wright preaching goddamn America. Democrats are afraid that Obama's heartfelt closeness to such a hater will make Obama not, not such a likable guy. They are right. Democrats are in a panic that Wright will be talked about often and thoroughly this time around. Democrats truly don't care that Obama chose a church that tries to build up black self-esteem by disparaging whites, America, and Israel. I care. I don't think you can increase someone's self-respect by denigrating others. I think it is just as evil to teach blacks to hate and fear whites as Obama's church did as the reverse. It matters to me that Obama chose a church that defines Jesus or denies Jesus was a Jew and claims he was black instead. Uh, Romney made a serious mistake by making a general statement repudiating discussion of the obama right relationship. There are several important principles at stake here. There have been no racist Republican attacks on Obama, none. We are better than that. We aren't even tempted to because we can win on the merits. Romney should be attacking the Democrat use of the racism accusation against Republicans as despicable, divisive, and bad for our democracy, not giving it validity. Political opposition is not racism. We need to hear Republican leaders saying that loudly and often. Second, Romney should insist that Obama's past should be vetted thoroughly, no double standards. His relationship with Wright is not trivial and not tangential. It provides important and illuminating insights into how Obama has governed and what we can expect in the second term. Third, the theology of your church may not be relevant to a political campaign, but what you take from church to apply to politics is entirely relevant. Obama pickled himself for decades in a church that taught black grievance and white guilt. His chosen guide and mentor preached envy, income redistribution, and hatred of rich whites, which included the entire middle class. We have seen in our president a politics right would be proud of. That is why it is both right and important to focus on right. Hear, hear. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, and here's the thing that's going to be really bad is because the guy that, that wrote that book uh, that you talked about Klein. earlier. Uh, yeah, Klein. He's making his way on the, the news circuit, on the news tour, and he has audio tapes of Jeremiah Wright basically telling Three that story. Three hours worth. Yeah, but he has him telling that story. Yeah, for Obama it is. Told yeah. Him. yeah. And so uh, whether he wants to or not, Wright's going to be – he's going to force himself into the forefront. Oh, we're going to talk about discussion. Wright. We're going to talk about Wright, and we're going to talk about other people too because I think what we found out over the last three years in reflection, we found out that the, the mainstream media, the Jurassic media, is irrelevant. They're not going to do their job, but there's so many other people jumping up and doing the job. Thank God for Andrew Breitbart. I mean, he, and, and well, and now that Andrew's gone for for his guys that that sure. pick up the mantle and start running with it, and you know whether they're, you know, the, whether they're doing it for Andrew or they're doing it for just the love of country. In either way, God bless them, and I hope that they keep it up. And I mean, even we're a small part. Our listenership keeps on getting bigger. I mean, it's not Andrew Breitbart, but uh, we're not the only ones out here. There's there's thousands of us. I, I just can't wait for the day when Andrew Breitbart links to us. Yeah, that'd be nice. One of these days. It just crash uh, the hell out of our server. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of uh, brouhaha on the anniversary of 
Osama bin Laden's uh, whacking uh, word, and, and all of it was actually uh, unnecessary. Yeah, Hank Crumpton, a former CIA officer, said that Clinton wouldn't authorize Osama bin Laden kill in 1999. Uh, Hank Crumpton, a former CIA officer and counterterrorism official, said in, an, in a recent interview that President Bill Clinton's White House missed a golden opportunity to take out terrorist leader Osama bin Laden in 1999. Bin Laden was in Afghanistan in 99, Crumpton told CBS's 60 Minutes in a segment that aired on Sunday. His convoy had clearly been identified by an early edition Predator drone, which at the same time didn't have weapons capability. We saw a security detail, a convoy, and we saw Bin Laden exit the vehicle clearly, Crumpton told US or CBS Laura Logan, describing aerial images captured by a drone flying somewhere outside of Kandahar. The optics were spot in. It was beaming back to us at CIA headquarters. We immediately alerted the White House, and the Clinton administration's response was, well, it'll take several hours to get the, for the T-LAMs the cruise missiles launched from submarines to reach that objective. So we need, you need to tell us where bin Laden will be in five or six hours from now. The frustration was enormous. Doesn't that now, just sound like Washington? Oh, absolutely. Now here's the thing. If you remember back, this is how far back it goes when they were having the Iran Contra hearings and they were talking to Ollie North yeah. and there, there was a, a uh, Senator at the time who s said to Ollie North, you just spent $200,000 on a home security system. What are you so afraid of? And he said, there's this man that is the embodiment of evil. And the senator said, what's, what's this man's name? He said, Osama bin Laden, and he will kill everyone that he can possibly kill if he gets yeah. a shot at it. And the senator start, and he mocked him and said, Os Osama bin Laden, what? what are you talking about? Unreal. That senator's name was Al Gore. Yeah. They were so misinformed about what type of uh, animal we were dealing with that they they didn't even acknowledge the fact that this guy was trying to kill us. That his and his target was the United States of America. I think the only thing they think of when they think of anything in the Islamic world is Saudi Arabian oil money. That's all they think about. Yeah. These, these people are prostitutes. They are. They're, they're just well. And, and then you know you get the thing where. It's, well, you know, you, you hear the, the lefties, you know, the only reason we went into Iraq was cause so we could get oil. Yeah. Somebody show me where we're getting free oil from Iraq. Even though we, we overran their country, we didn't, we, and to define something that we were accused of, we are not an occupying force. We went over there at the request of the country. Well, not at the, the only people of that's Iraq. That are, the only people that are over there right now is Hillary Clinton's people. Exactly. So. But my point is, we didn't go over there to take oil. The, mm -hmm. You know, all, it's a real nice bumper sticker to say that this is a war for oil and all that other shit. And, and, and American soldiers, you know, airmen, Marines, Army, Navy, the people are dying for oil because it sure as hell doesn't look like we're getting any. Mm -hmm. So where the hell does this, where does this theory come from? I mean, like I said, it's great, you know. Bumper sticker fall. On the one hand, they say that. On the other hand, they shut down the Keystone oil pipeline. Yeah. You know, it's exactly. lovely. Uh, the next story is called the Obama thugocracy, and it's quite long. Uh, so I'm not going to, I did it again, Ward. I underlined too much. Uh, <laughs> now I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. George C. Scott as General George S. Patton. That was a hell one of, of my favorite movies. Hell of, of all a time. movie, yeah. Uh, what a waste of fine infantry. Uh, and then uh, we're playing with water guns. They're playing with scuds. These people are terrorists. There is a war. If we treat it as less than a war, we will lose it. MSCO CEO Mark Stevens to Heritage Foundation on fighting the left. I couldn't agree with you more. Mark Stevens and Frank Vandersloot. Stevens is the Rush Limbaugh sponsor whose company and personal safety were threatened because he refused to buckle to the far-left haters in the Sandra Fluke affair. He is speaking out again, and he pulls no punches. But before we get to Mark Stevens and the enthusiastically received, sensational talk he gave at the Heritage Foundation's 35th Annual Resource Bank Conference in Colorado, let's talk about Frank Vandersloot. Why? 
because what Mark Stevens is discussing, the rise of domestic terrorism associated with the Obama left and the recent investigation of Romney contributor Vandersloot by a company called Fusion GPS, are most assuredly part and parcel of the same issue. Here is Mr. Vandersloot just last night on the O'Reilly Factor discussing what has been happening to him. Correction, is happening to him. Who paid Glenn Simpson's Fusion GPS to investigate Romney contributor Frank Vandersloot? Now there's a question for congressional investigators or bloggers. While the dirt sought on Vandersloot by Fusion investigator Michael Wolf was public, as revealed in a superb report by the Wall Street Journal's Kim Strassel, Divorce Records, a case involving a dispute with an ex-employee. Strassel has it exactly right when she terms this trolling for dirt. Accepting the fact that divorce records are public, as was whatever paperwork was involved in the case with Vandersloot's ex-employee, this trolling for dirt business, right down to the mystery of who paid the tab for Fusion to do this, reminds of one very disturbing historical precedent. That would be the Nixon White House authorizing the break-in to the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist by the so-called plumbers, the Nixon White House Special Investigations Unit. Follow the money. Who was the Obama supporter who supplied the bucks to pay Fusion GPS to burrow into files in the presumed bowels of an Idaho Falls County Clerk's Office with the goal of wrecking the reputation and business of a Romney contributor named Frank Vandersloot? And why isn't there a demand to the Obama campaign for an internal investigation and the necessary five minutes to supply the name? After all, this whole incident originated with that official Obama site, Keeping the GOP Honest, on which Vandersloot's name was published, along with several other Romney Super PAC do donors. Uh, I mean, what did Obama campaign officials David Axelrod and Jim Messina know, and when did they know it? The Watergate, these, they want people to go to jail on this one. The Watergate scandal not only famously brought Nixon's resignation and the imprisonment of his senior White House staff, it also sent to jail or indicted officials of Nixon's 1972 re-election campaign, including his campaign manager, Nixon's version of Axelrod and Messina, former Attorney General John Mitchell. Mitchell was convicted of conspiracy, obstruction, this just makes my mouth water, I want to see Holder do the perp walk. Obstruction of justice and perjury. At one point, as memorably recorded by Watergate's reporter heroes, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, Mitchell threatened the Washington Post publisher by saying, Katie Graham's going to get her tit caught in a big fat ringer if that's published. The left howled in fury at the idea of threatening the Washington Post, but liberals have no problem with threatening Rush Limbaugh. Now, does any of this Vandersloop business sound familiar? Yes, it does. Before Frank, Frank Vandersloot, the target was Rush Limbaugh advertiser Mark Stevens. Before Stevens, the target was Rush Limbaugh. Before that, it was Pat Buchanan. Before that, it was Glenn Beck. Before that, it was Lou Dobbs. So you can see, ladies and gentlemen, this is, uh, this is just uh, something that needs to be, we need to get grown-ups back in the White House. Uh, Stevens said... We have to, and he doesn't. He doesn't pull any punches. This Stevens guy is stand up. We have to stop using euphemisms. Us. We have to stop saying that there's a national debate. We have to stop saying that there's a great divide. We have to stop saying that we're having a national conversation. None of that is happening. What there is is a war. There is a war. There is a war. If we treat it as less than a war, we will not win. This rush issue and others like it that are happening right now are not boycotts. These are not boycotts. That's a very sweet term for what it really is, which is internal American terrorism. These people are terrorists. You do not have to put on a suicide bomber's belt to engage in terrorism. Terrorism is the act of invoking fear in people. And when you do that, and you do that successfully, you get people to change their behavior, and you cave to them, and they win. And as long as we keep playing by the rules of anything but war and not recognize that we are being engaged in a terrorist activity, we will lose our country. So we have to change the rules of the game. Ladies and gentlemen, go to the show notes links page. Uh, that's a long article by Jeffrey Lord, the same as uh, last week's long article. But uh, it is a really stunning – again, I did not uh, really even touch the surface. There's so much more in that article and uh, I'm just not going to be able to get to it. But uh, I'll tell you, that was uh, that was something. Now, I believe this is the, yeah, this is the, the next story uh, came to us via another listener, I believe. 
uh, is the dead man walking one the one that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Ward, why don't you tell the folks where this came from and take it uh, away? Yeah, this came from a, a listener, uh, Corey Charette, who is the producer of Say It Productions. And he sent us a story of dead man walking tricks airport into giving him top security job. The TSA may have its eagle eyes set on your underwear and your water bottle, but it failed to miss the real security threat under its nose. It was revealed Monday after a supervisor holding a top security job in the New Jersey airport was arrested f for using the stolen identity of a dead man. This is going to be a hell of a name. Bimbo <laughs> Olamaku... Uh, Bimbo. Uh, I'm going to call him Bob. <laughs> um, was known to his fellow workers as Jerry Thomas. We'll go with Jerry. Uh, we'll go with he Jerry. Obtained his, yeah, okay. We'll go with Jerry. Uh, obtained his job as a security supervisor at the Newark Liberty International Airport with credentialed he, credentials he had allegedly stolen in 1992 from a petty criminal who was shot and killed in New York that year, according to CBS. Authorities say Oil Wally, sure, why not? Jerry Thomas. Jerry Thomas, uh, <laughs> who entered the U.S. illegally in 1989, began using Thomas's birth certificate and Social Security number three weeks before he was murdered. Uh, though there's no immediate evidence that he was involved in Thomas's death, he used these documents to obtain a New Jersey driver's license in Thomas's name, as well as state security guard license, airport identification, and security and credit cards. He used the fraudulent documents to gain employment with several contractors at the Newark airport and most recently with the FJC security, uh, security services. At the time of his arrest on Monday, he was supervising 30 other security guards at the airport, including <laughs> workers responsible for inspecting cargo vehicles, according to the Associated Press. His job also gave him unfettered access to the tarmac and to passenger planes. The Newark airport is one of the busiest in the nation. More than 33 million travelers passed through it in 2010. Now, th this is the TSA at its finest. You know, th they're keeping us safe. They can't even keep their own house safe. You know, this guy's... It's amazing. I mean, they... They, they, they vetted him the same way they vetted Obama. <laughs> the, whole, the whole TSA, it seems like every day a new story comes out about them. It's just amazing. It, it was better before they got there, except for those three planes. But uh, yeah. hey, it's good to see uh, Corey back in action. He took a hiatus for a while there. Uh, just for the listeners, uh, Ward used to do a show uh, with Corey, uh, Average Joe show, and I was on the show a couple times. So he's one of the OGs of podcasting. It's good to uh, see him back on there. Look up Say It Productions. He's got a show about autism. He's got a show about with him and his son, I believe now. And they have one about uh, sci-fi or something. There's a bunch of different sci-fi uh, one. There's a, a talk duo. It's just basically him and uh, his girlfriend shooting the shit. It, it, it's usually pretty uh, pretty amusing because Corey's a, a pretty funny guy. Yeah, and he uh, he listens to the show and you know helps us on Facebook and everything like that. So uh, glad to see you back in the world, Corey. Good deal. Hope you enjoy the show. Uh, Van Jones said something recently that uh, was quite interesting. He said that the left stayed quiet during the BP spill because Obama was a Democrat. Imagine that. Uh, Van Jones, incidentally, is a self-avowed communist uh, who's also a truther, signed a petition saying that he thought George W. Bush was the man responsible uh, for 9-11, that we just blew ourselves up like that. Two years after the worst marine oil spill in history, former White House advisor Van Jones now admits that he and other progressives sat quietly on the sidelines to avoid making President Obama look bad, as the blaze notes. You've never seen the environmental movement more quiet during an oil spill. I guarantee you, if John McCain had been president with that oil spill, or George Bush had been president with that oil spill, I'd have been out there with a sign protesting. I didn't because of who the president was. Well, that's bad. Uh-uh. That's not good for the earth. It's not good for the cause. It's probably not good for the president. It's certainly not the way we should conduct ourselves. And so I'm very tough on progressive movements and leaders, including myself, who did not stand on principle based on who we looked across and saw as president. Conveniently, Jones's admission against interest comes years after the fact, at a time when the oil spill is fairly low on the nation's radar. Though Jones' comments seem limited to the Deepwater Horizon spill, 
The same could really be said for the anti-war mo movement. There were large protests in many cities in 07 and 08 against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Once Obama took office, all that public opposition melted away. This is despite the fact that Obama ordered a surge of troops in Afghanistan, failed to close the prison facility at Gitmo, and actually increased the number of deadly drone strikes. The mainstream media also deserves a lot of the blame here. It's understandable partisans like Van Jones would only speak up uh, when their speech can be used against the GOP. What's not clear is why the supposedly neutral media also lost interest in the anti-war and environmentalist movements the moment Obama took office. It seems the mainstream media is just an echo chamber for progressive chatter, one that neither tones down obviously partisan attacks or plays up their absence when a Democrat takes office. That's true. I mean, that's just uh, completely 100% true. The media, uh, and again, Ward, I got to tell you, we got to have a conversation about this. I think we're taking over for them. And I'm talking about people that are a little bit more organized than we are, people that do this for a living and sell advertising and everything else. Yeah, the, the Breitbarts and whatnot. Uh, Glenn Beck has know. created an empire, too. He moved, yeah. he moved his whole operation to Texas. And, I mean, he bought a big, giant, I guess it was like a warehouse, and he created a studio, and he's adding shows, and he's got, he's got viewers I mean, I don't know how many. He hasn't really. I I don't watch it every day. I like watching the radio show on video. That's uh. Maybe we need to contact him and see if you know he can at least give us a shout out or you know we can should, do yeah. something on his show. That'd be whatever. nice. But I'll tell you. He, uh, but I I think it's happening all over the place. I think that uh, the internet reporters are breaking the stories and they're force feeding them on the media. I think that if you're an American, and you get your news from any one of the networks, including Fox. You're out of your mind. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's very similar to, to when uh, what's his name the the guy he he worked with Andrew um, Drudge Breitbart, who Matt Drudge? No, 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 the the one that, that busted open Acorn. You know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember his name. It's, yeah, I can't remember. It can't, it's just not coming to me right now. But anyway, you know, he went out. He did investigative reporting, and then you had, you know, the mainstream media would have never picked that up. Never picked that up, but Breitbart is the one who pushed it and pushed it and pushed it to the point where everybody knew what was going on. And, you know, that's what has to happen. They, they forced it on the media, and the media, oh, boy, did that piss them off. Yeah, and because they, they had no option. But oh, they tried to make this guy into every kind of a fraud. Yeah. They really they even put him in jail for a time. Yeah, and he got out. And he did. He, but that, In fact, that, he just did a, a video on... Uh, voter fraud. On voter fraud. Several of them. He goes in there, and, and he... Uh, as a matter of fact, he got Eric Holder's voter card. Yeah. He went into Eric Holder's voting office and told them he was Eric Holder and they were going to let him vote as Eric Holder. He always he always backs away at the last minute and says he has to go get his ID. But he had it right there. They, they said, no, just make a mark. If you can't sign, just put an X here. Yeah, put an X here and I'll... I'll uh, well, do I have to... Can I'll I get, witness it. Do I have to get my ID? Well, you don't need any ID. If you're who you say... If you say that you're somebody, then you're that guy. It's bizarre. Now this guy in Congress, uh, the civil rights uh, icon that's on the committee with Issa, I can't, his name's, the, he's the guy that said that they spit at him and called him the N-word and all that, yeah. Elijah Cummings or something, or something like that. Yeah. But and, uh, and, he's saying. And, Drudge put, or, and then Breitbart put up 100 grand and said, right. give me a video. Yeah. Give me a video. Here's $100,000. You give me that video, I'll air it. But he, he's on the wait. record. He's on the record as saying the GOP is making it harder and harder for the average voter to vote. And I'm thinking, are you nuts? Are are you that nuts? The, the thing is, look at all the stuff that you need to have identification for. Sure. All right. You you go to get a driver's license. You need to have. You know, even a young kid. Young kid goes in there. He has to have a social security card, and, and a birth certificate. That's what's needed. I don't see why. You can't get a right, why it's I'm so gonna, difficult. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and, and this could be perceived as profiling or, or whatever. But don't you need ID card to get food stamps? You need an ID card for well, apparently you need an ID card for everything. I mean, I would I would venture to guess that the 45 million people that are on food stamps right now, I would venture to guess that at least 40 million of them are Obama supporters. Oh yeah. 
you know because he put them all on he put them all on the public tent i mean when you when you vote money for yourself that just is something that you shouldn't do that you know and and i just I, i'm sa i'm sorry that people are you know under the gun as far as food but uh, maybe I'm just cynical because I live in the city and I see the way these these programs are administered and I look in the shopping carts of people that are using other taxpayers' money to buy their steaks. Uh, lobster. I, I mean, I see that with my own eyes. That's not something that I read about. And uh, anyway, that's just uh, <laughs> the whole ID thing is ridiculous. That's like, just Hutch being bitter. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the thing is, it's it's like basically anybody who's making that argument if I was, because the, the way they make the argument is they make it into a race thing. The Democrats do, not the Republicans. The, the, the Democrats make it into a, that's just racist if you require them. And, and I'm thinking, if I'm a black person and they're telling me I'm too stupid to get an ID card, that's going to piss me off. And I just don't understand the, the mentality. Here's the Here's the thing, Hutch. These people that that it's it's so detrimental and it, it's so such an imposition for them to to register, you know, to have a, a voter registration card. These are the same people that have driver's licenses. Yeah. You, you know, you never see any. They don't have a driver's license. And they don't that, have a form of identification. I heard something like one hundred fifty thousand. If you go to cash a check, you go to cash a check. There, even if you don't have a driver's license, they're going to say you need a state register, a state identification. Yeah. I mean, there's 150,000 dead people that they recorded that voted in Florida. Yeah. These states are refusing, the, the, the uh, blue states, the Democrat-controlled states, are refusing to purge their records of dead people. Now, why would you do that? There's only one reason why you would do that, because you can't win in a fair fight. You can't win on the battlefield of ideas. You just can't do it. So what do you, what do, you do if that's where you are? If that's where you are, and, and political power is the most important thing in your being, you cheat. Yep. And that's where we are, ladies and gentlemen. And and it's uh, it's it's unfortunate that so many people are on the bandwagon. It really is. I, I think it's all about education. It really is. The Mitt Romney or somebody with Mitt Romney has an, a golden opportunity right now to educate the American people, because a lot of them, the whole thing about it is there's only a very small uh, percentage of people like us, Ward. You know, there's only a very small percentage of people that follow things as closely as we do. You know, so we're not talking about us. We're talking about the rest of the people that are watching Glee. That's what we got to educate. Yeah, absolutely. You know, or, because, uh, you know, and, and that's why we, that's the one reason we do this show. And we've, and we've said that all along that we do it just so that, you know, so that you don't have to, so that you can, you know, listen to us and, and we'll follow the stories and, and, and make them available to you. But it's one, that's one of the things we need to, to start doing this. You know? And just for the, for the listening audience, uh, the seven or eight stories that we do are compiled out of hundreds that we look at. Yeah. Hundreds, literally. Every day from the day after the show or sometimes the day of the show to the day before the next show. Uh, so we, we kind of select what we feel out of all of that noise uh, would benefit you in your decision-making processes. That and, and we're trying to expose this criminality that's going on. The criminality is beyond belief. I mean, it's, I, I've studied a lot, and Bill Clinton was a, was a criminal too, but he was in a different way. And he was much stealthier and not as blatant, and he was more politically pragmatic. And that's why well, he, he was, the thing was, Clinton was smart enough not to lie, not to do the bold faced lie and say, no, this won't happen. And he went you to know, the right after he got beat. <laughs> after yeah. the congressional elections, he went to the right and he ended up being pretty successful. And it was nice because in order for him to get his leftist policies passed, he had to sign some really good bills, you know, the Welfare Reform Act and a whole lot of other things. Uh, that Newt Gingrich was able to uh, shepherd through the house, you know. So that was uh, that's the way it, this guy should have done it. I mean, but he's just too ideology ideologically bent that he can't do it. He thinks he's right still. Uh, and I got a, I got one thing I got to bring up too. That last week was the one thousand one hundred and eleventh day that this Senate went without producing a budget. Hmm. 
there, there was the anniversary. It was the 1,111th day. That's amazing. That, that this Senate has that not that's not a news elected. story tells you all you need to know about the media. That that is not a, that that is unprecedented, ladies and gentlemen. It has never no, happened. It's in a America. violation of the Constitution. It's the Constitution never happened. States that they will present that they will produce a a, a budget once a year, and they haven't done it for three years. That's it's nuts. And the only reason, ladies and gentlemen, that they, that they haven't done it is because they're lying to you. They can't tell you what they want. Because if they did, you'd, you'd kick them out. And that's the whole reason. I mean, it's it's something. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for letting us into your lives for an hour. Contact the show by email, steelcityresistance at gmail.com. You can now listen to the show right on the Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash steelcityresistance. Uh, what else, Ward? What else is going on? Um, let's see. You did that and that. Um, SCR TV. You can see yeah, this show in a day or two. You can actually watch our beautiful faces talk about this news. Uh, you can do. Uh, <laughs> now, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this episode is going to be delayed, and it's actually going to come up at the end of the week. I have to. I have to go somewhere that I'm not going to have too much internet connectivity, and uh, that's just it's sad. But it's one episode out of many. Uh, you'll have to catch it late. That's just how it rolls. I didn't mean. Yeah, I didn't sometimes mean. Sometimes that's the way it is. Life gets in the way. Call the show 412-254-3750, and we'll put you on there. We put Eric on there. Opposing views are are accepted. No problem. Uh, that's oh, and one more thing. Twitter. You can do yeah. hit up hashtag scrpgh, and anything that that has that hashtag. I hope there wasn't anything on there because I didn't check that. I got in. Late. I've been checking. We haven't had a whole. Okay, good. All Most right, not good, mind. not good, but hey. There was yeah, something on there. I thought I saw something on there. Anyway, we'll cover it next week. Uh, thanks again. If you don't have anything else, Ward, that's about all I got. No, sir. I'm over and out. Nice. All right. Yeah, there's nothing I can do. I'm going out to Camp Atterbury, man. There's no way. 